One of the great mysteries, one of the great mysteries in the world in which we live is the fact, the economic, historical, political fact that free markets work. Um, and yet, that everybody hates them. Free markets produce unbelievable amounts of wealth, prosperity, longevity, human well-being, everywhere they're tried, to the extent that they are tried, they're incredibly successful. I'll go through some examples to try to at least illustrate the point. And yet, nobody likes free, free markets. No country holds on to them. Right? The trend over the last over the last few decades easily is away from free markets, more regulations, more controls, more government regulations. Certainly in the United States of America, the uh, country that used to be very free, relatively capitalistic, had free markets. Today, it's not free at all. Generally, uh, you know, countries that have been free in the past a decline. Uh, you know, we've got some South Americans here, so it's a good. It, you know, we've got we got some great examples of this in in Latin America. So I don't know how much you know about Latin America, but um, the the country that used to be uh, the poorest country in Latin America. Anybody know what that was? What's the poorest country in Latin America today? Venezuela. Venezuela. Venezuela is the poorest country in Latin America today. On a per capita GDP basis, Venezuela is the poorest country. It's also the most socialist or, or, or uh, country in, in Latin America. Uh, what is the richest country in Latin America today? Argentina or Chile? Chile. Chile is the richest country in Latin America today. 40 years ago, 30 years ago, what was the richest country in Latin America? Venezuela. 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 What was the poorest country in Latin America 30, 40 years ago? Chile. Chile. <laughs> What's the difference? Economic policy. Economic policy. Chile adopted markets by accident almost. In uh, the early 1980s, it adopted economic liberalization. It freed up its markets. It protected private property. It respected contracts. Uh, it, it, it encouraged entrepreneurship. And it basically left people alone. It even privatized it's social security. It privatized that, and it became very quickly the richest country in Latin America. Venezuela went the opposite route. It nationalized. It moved away from free markets. It moved away from private property. It moved away from contracts. And it very, very quickly, in a matter of 20 years, became the poorest country in Latin America. So that's just one of, I think, hundreds of experiments that we have been running in the world over the last 200 years in terms of what economic political policies work if the measure of work is prosperity and what economic social policies don't work. You've got a living example right now in North versus South Korea. I don't know if anybody's been, I think some of you have been to Korea, but um, uh, South Korea is a flourishing wealthy, successful country. North Korea is basically dead. There's nothing there. The best best image to illustrate the difference between North and South Korea is that satellite photo. I don't know how many of you have seen the satellite photo of the Korean Peninsula at night. <clears throat> and the South is all lit up because there's electricity and people have homes and offices and street lights and it's all lit up. And the North is all dark, a little bit of light in, in near the capital, but generally all dark. Difference between authoritarianism, call it whatever you want to call it, right? And relative freedom, relative free markets. South Korea is relative free, it flourishes. North Korea is oppressive, it's dead. There's nothing there. There's just poverty. Of course, you guys lived it, East West Germany. Sometimes I have to tell, remind people that. Um, you know, the wall was built to prevent people from fleeing communism, not the other way around, because young people have to still have the belief that communism is some utopia, some ideal, some wonderful thing. 
Um, and uh, you'd think that the last 70 years would have proved otherwise, and yet communism is still around. We still have kids at the universities here. If I was giving a talk, if I was a radical leftist, so I was a radical leftist Marxist, and I was giving a talk here in Berlin, I would have an audience 10 times larger. <laughs> communism is popular, free markets are not, even though communism led to poverty, destruction, and death. Freedom, free markets have led to prosperity. So something's going on here. Because the system that seems to allow for human success, for human wealth, for human flourishing, for prosperity economically, is the system we hate the most. And systems that are oppressive to human, to, to human beings, that result in poverty and destruction, tend to be systems that are popular, which is, to say the least, bizarre. It's just strange. But it is the reality with which we live. So one has to ask a question why? What is it about free markets? And, and, and I'm not using the term capitalism because I think ta- capitalism is a much more loaded term. But uh, capitalism is not just freedom in markets, but capitalism is freedom in, in everything. Capitalism is a system where your individual rights are fully respected, particularly your property rights, where you're left free to pursue your values, free of coercion, free of force. Capitalism is a political, social, economic system. We've never really had capitalism. But what's really amazing is that the closer we got to capitalism, the more successful the economic system is, the political system is, the further away we get from capitalism, the more destructive it is. And again, everybody's against capitalism in spite of that. Everybody's against free markets in spite of that. So the question, I think an important question we have to ask ourselves as human beings, as people interested in ideas, as people interested in the world out there, is why? What is it about capitalism, what is it about free markets that people hate so much? Because there's something about it that we resent, that we resent so much that even though it's successful, even though it leads to prosperity, even though it leads to economic success, we still hate it. So we're willing to override that. So let me ask you, what free markets involve people participating in markets, free of coercion, free of intervention, free of government. But, but why do people engage in markets? What, in, in other words, what's capitalism? What are free markets really about? What, are, what is the purpose of a free market? What is the purpose of any market? Even a market that you go down to you know, down the street. What's what's the purpose of the market? What do people do in a market? Exchange goods. They value less for stuff they value more. Yes, and exchange goods, uh, generally, they give away the stuff that they value less. They get something they value more. That's trade. It's it's a a win-win relationship. But before we even get there, why are they going to the marketplace to begin with? So, uh, you know, if if I'm... I'm, um, my iPhone, right? <laughs> it appears in all my videos that people laugh because they're familiar with it. So my, uh, you know, why is Steve Jobs making these? Why, 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 did, why did Apple build them? Why did Steve Jobs initially invent them, think of them, produce them, create them, sell them? Who did he do it for? Yeah. I mean, it serves the need of a customer. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know I needed an iPhone before Steve Jobs taught me I needed an, I, I, I needed an iPhone. The beauty of production is that the thing about great producers is they create demand. They don't satisfy demand. Demand isn't there until they actually create the product. And then the demand shows up. Because they're teaching you. One of the beauties of production is it teaches you the things you need. You don't know what you need. Steve Jobs knows what you need. Or well, you, when he was alive. You didn't know what you need. Yeah, but, but why did he satisfy demand? What, because he cared about me? Did, I, did Steve Jobs build the iPhone for me? Yeah. Because it's a product we buy the benefit from. He, he, because? Because we can do so much things with it. Because we'll benefit from. Yeah, we benefit so, from. So did Steve Jobs build this so I could benefit from? No, for money. Well, he built it, certainly part of this was for money, right? 
And it's, it's it, it, you know, he made money off of this. Like the first iPhones had a profit margin over 50%. He made a lot of money off of iPhones. He could have sold it to me a lot cheaper if he cared about me. So, this, so Steve Jobs built this for money, profit, right? And we all feel a little, little uncomfortable even thinking that, never mind saying it, which says something about the world in which we live. But, and we'll get to that, but it's not just about money. What else did Steve Jobs, why else did Steve Jobs build this? Yeah. He looked for something that fulfilled himself. Yeah, he loved it. Yeah, this is great. The consequence of creating something that was great for the public. Yeah, he had a vision. He wanted to create something new. He wanted to create something beautiful, right? I mean, this is a beautiful thing. He wanted to create something productive. He wanted to create something that, would, that, that people would love using. But who did he build this for? For himself. For Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs could make money. So Steve Jobs could have fun. So Steve Jobs could be satisfied that he produced this amazing thing. Steve Jobs produced this. And at the end of the day, you go to work, not for your customers. Hopefully, you like your work. You go to work for you. You enjoy it. You like it. It fulfills something in you. you it allows you to pursue certain values. You're making a living. At the end of the day, production, work, is something we do for ourselves. Now, I remember the first iPhone I bought was in 2008. Right? And uh, the US economy was spiraling into recession. I, many of you are too young to remember 2008, but 2008 was a great recession. And the uh, US economy spiraling into recession. And I went out and I bought my iPhone because I wanted to make the world a better place. I wanted to help my fellow man. I wanted to make sure people had jobs and I'd be taught by the Keynesians that consumption drives, uh, drives the economy. So I wanted to help boost the economy. <laughs> Because I know that's why you guys go shopping. <laughs> you guys shop because you want to help make sure that people are employed and have jobs. And no, for my own benefit. <laughs> you go buy stuff for whose benefit? For my own benefit. For your own benefit. You're going shopping because you want to go buy something that you believe will make your life better. No. Steve Jobs sells his products because he's that's to make his life better. You're buying his products to make your life better. And this is not a unique crowd, any crowd in the world. If I ask people why they go out and buy their shoes or buy their clothes, they say because we're trying to make our lives better. So markets are places in which we go in pursuit of our own values, our own interests, our own well-being. Markets are places we go in pursuit of self-interest. Markets are all about self-interest. They're all about people pursuing self-interest. And this is, this is not a new observation. Uh, Adam Smith, in The Wealth of Nations, written a long time ago, wrote, he wrote that the baker bakes the bread, not because he cares about you. He bakes the bread because he's trying to make a living. And hopefully he enjoys baking bread. And of course you don't buy the bread because you care about the baker. You buy the bread because you want to eat. You're better off buying the bread, he's better off baking the bread. Win-win. But you're not doing it for the win-win, you're doing it for the you. Fundamentally, markets are about self-interest. Fundamentally, everything about markets are about pursuing your own values on your own terms. Mm -hmm. And you don't transact if the terms are not appropriate. Everything about capitalism smacks from self-interest. It's all about people being Selfish, to use a term nobody likes. So, Adam Smith told us this 200 something years ago, but Adam Smith said the same as everybody else says. So Adam Smith said, yeah, it's all about being selfish. And selfishness is bad. We know selfishness is bad. We've all, I mean, our mothers taught us that, our preachers teach us that. <laughs> Uh, our philosophers taught us that, certainly German philosophers have taught us that. Selfishness, being self-interested, is bad. Pursuing your own self-interest as an end is bad. It's not moral. It's not virtuous. And Adam Smith says, that's okay. Because when you add up all the self-interested activities of all these different people, what you get as a sum is society's better off. So the sum of vices 
is a virtue. And let me tell you, nobody believes that. Capitalism's problem, the reason we hate capitalism, the reason most people hate capitalism, is because they know that capitalism equals self-interest. And they know, because everybody teaches it, that self-interest is evil, bad, or at the very best, amoral. What is morality? If we talk about morality, if we talk about ethics, what is it to be ethical? What is it to be moral? What have we been taught? To be uh, altruistic. We are taught to be like that. To be altruistic. Yeah. To think of others first. To live for the sake of others. The whole focus of morality is on how we treat other people. So, benefiting other people, that is virtuous, right? Benefiting yourself, that is not virtuous. That's what we're taught. So you would think that when you benefit other people, you would be considered a moral, morally a good person. Who is the greatest, who are the greatest beneficiaries of mankind? Who, have, who has benefited human beings? What profession? has benefited human beings more than any other profession. At least materially. Inventors? It, yeah, inventors are important, but inventors, uh, often their inventor sits in their garage and nothing ever happens to it. I would say investors. <laughs> Investors, financiers? Yeah. So capitalists? Yeah, basically, people who look for the good idea and give the scientists look for the good idea. Certainly, I, th I I think that's a category within a broader category that that I'm talking about. I'd say business people, with of which I agree with you. Investors are actually the most important, and not just investors because we love venture capitalists, but bankers, the people we love to hate. They we hate them more than anybody. I've got a book. It's called the Moral Case for Finance. And, the, and, and it has essays there about the, why banking is virtuous and why finance is the noblest profession. Because exactly for the reason you said. The, 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 the inventor doesn't get out of his garage without capital. The inventor also doesn't get out of the garage without a CEO, without a business, a business expertise, without the knowledge how to build a business. It's one thing to invent, something else to build a business around it. It's one thing to invent, it's another thing to talk, turn that invention into a the type of thing that people want to use and that people can use. <clears throat> I mean, think about Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was not an innovator. He didn't take care of his garage. That was Wozniak. We barely know Wozniak. We know Steve Jobs because he knew how to organize. He knew he had a vision. He knew and he knew how to market. He knew how to sell. You have to get it into the hands of the consumers. But that all that category, put that category from banker to innovator to CEO Businessmen are the people who've taken us out of the mud, out of the hut, out of subsistence farming, and brought us into wealth, into the world in which we live. Without them, none of this exists. Without their knowledge, their energy, their willingness to take risk, whether it's risk of capital, risk of their time, nothing exists. You don't even have labor without capital and without businessmen. Labor never comes together, starts a business. It just doesn't happen. Somebody has to have that idea. You have to have an entrepreneur. You have to have the capital to pay the labor until the, the business become profitable. And yet, we all hate businessmen. I mean, we, not maybe in this room, but generally the culture. Why? Again, because businessmen are pursuing their own profit. Worse than all of the financiers. Because the financiers are turning money into money. So you don't even see a product. Right? They're behind the scenes. That's why they're always behind every conspiracy theory as well. Because of the people that are unseen. A, a businessman who produces, like Steve Jobs, who produces a product can hide behind the product and say, Look, I'm doing something good for mankind. But a financier who sits behind that has a much harder time. It's a much more abstract role much more difficult to explain to people how productive a function he's, he, he, he is actually uh, pursuing. I mean, so think about this. 
the most, the people who benefited society the most, other human beings the most, are business people. We still hate them. So I don't know about this altruism stuff. They say what they what you should do is help other people. Well, Steve Jobs helped other, other people. Bill Gates helped other people. How did they help other people? We talked about this, right? I buy an iPhone for a thousand bucks. How much is this worth to me? More. Much more. I mean, this is worth tens of thousands of dollars to me. Don't tell Apple. But it's worth <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars to me. Just in terms of the quality of life, improvement. I, I remember, you guys don't, but I remember what life was like before this. This has improved life dramatically, particularly for somebody like me who travels a lot. This is a life changer. When I moved to, uh, from Israel to the United States in 1987, um, my, all my family's in, in Israel. Never called them. I would never talk to my parents. Not because I didn't like them, but because it was too expensive. Long distance phone calls were super expensive in those days. They couldn't afford it, I couldn't afford it. So we talked like, give me two months. Right? Now, I can talk to anybody, anywhere in the world, for as long as I want by video, at a cost of it's nothing. zero. I have access to every piece of music ever written, ever p p produced at a marginal cost of zero. I have maps, navigate any city in the world without having to look at a map. Again, you guys don't remember driving and looking at a map at the same time. Uh, it was very, very dangerous. I mean, the benefits of this uh, through the roof. I know you have a question. Can we leave it for the question period, or do you want to? Uh, no, I just wanted to answer your question. Uh, oh, which one? Uh, pardon? Which question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, you, you, you just asked uh, for what price uh, you are doing this video call stuff. I wanted to answer the question. Oh, this. okay. He, okay. He wanted yeah, to. okay. okay. Um, so, I, my life is better off by tens of thousands of dollars. Steve Jobs made some money off of this. Probably less than tens of thousands of dollars because they don't cost a thousand, right? He's better off, I'm better off. Every time a businessman makes money in a free market, he is making the world a better place. The only way to become a billionaire is to make a lot of people's lives better. You cannot be a billionaire in a free market and not have made other people's lives better. Hundreds of millions of people's lives better. Sometimes billions of lives better. I would argue Bill Gates, by creating the PC revolution, changed the lives of billions of people on planet Earth. He's not a hero. He's not a mall hero. We're not building statues. We're not naming roads. Like, who's a mall hero? If I say mall hero, what name comes to mind? Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Yeah, <laughs> What's that? Hercules. Hercules. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> not Hercules is a mall, a mall hero, okay? Because he helps other people, he goes fight for them and all of that. But Mother Teresa is a great example. Mother Teresa comes to mind as a mall hero. She, she's a saint after all. She, uh, you know, there are a lot of statues of Mother Teresa out there. Why is she a hero? Because she helped a lot of people. No, but she did so altruistically. Which and means what? Without any self-interest. Yeah, without any reward. gain to herself. On the contrary, she did it while suffering. She did it while not being happy. She did it clearly as a sacrifice. If she had been happy, holding parties, celebrating her successes, being, you know, and, and really helping people at the same time, she wouldn't have been a saint. What made her a saint is she was as poor as the people she was helping. She seemed like she was suffering. If you read her diary, she was in agony the whole time. That's what makes you a saint. Now, if you go to the museum here in Berlin, there are probably some Renaissance paintings of some saints. Any of them happy? Any of them smiling? Any of them doing fun stuff? <laughs> no, because the whole point of being a saint is not to help other people. The whole point of being a saint is to suffer. The whole point of morality, as we understand it, is not to help other people. 
If that was the standard, just helping other people, then our businessmen would be moral giants. The whole point of our morality is about individual suffering. It's about not being self-interested. In a sense, it's a negative. Don't pursue your self-interest. Don't be successful. Don't be happy. And if you can help other people while not being happy, while not being successful. So even somebody like Bill Gates, when he's an entrepreneur and he's helping hundreds of millions of people, and we hate his guts. And when, it, when, when the American Justice Fund goes after him to try to break up Microsoft, everybody's excited and everybody thinks that's great. When does Bill Gates become a little bit of a hero? For a little while, until COVID, right? For a little while. When he... When he starts to give stuff more... Yeah, when he goes, when, yeah. leaves Microsoft, God forbid you do anything productive, leaves Microsoft and goes and starts a foundation and starts giving his money away. Giving money away, that's good. That we love. Charity, we love. Production, not so much. But charity, that's cool. How many people will he help in his charity? I mean, a lot. Probably does some good work. More or less than in his business. A lot less. The world was not changed by charity. Like I often tell people, you know, in, in, the, in America, at least this is more of an American story, in uh, 1776, when America was founded, it was a third-rate colony. The British didn't care that much about it. That's why they didn't really fight. Uh, it, it, it was poor. It, it was meaningless. Within 130, 20, 30 years, it was the strongest military and economic force on planet Earth. By, by World War I, America was the top country in the world. How did that happen? How did that transition happen? Because of charity? Because of community service? Because of Mother Teresa's of the world? No, because of business. Because of the Carnegie's and the Mellons and the, and the Rockefellers and the people who built America and who made a lot of money doing it. And what do we call those people in America? Robber barons. Robber barons. They're crooks. They're bad guys. We hate them. Why? Because they built America. They made the country. And every country has the same story. We resent the people who actually are responsible for the success. And that's all driven by this morality. The morality of altruism is anti-markets. It's anti-capitalism. It's anti, I would say, human nature. It's a morality, you know, arguably comes from Christianity. It's a morality that worships sacrifice. It worships pain. It worships suffering. And yes, if you help some other people on the side, that's okay. But success, prosperity, happiness, wealth, those don't count. Again, at best, amoral, but usually amoral. So why do people hate capitalism? Why do people hate free markets? They hate capitalism and free markets because capitalism and free markets are based on an immoral system. They're based on self-interest. They're based on people pursuing their own well-being, both on the production and the consumption side. But on every part of every part of a market, what you see is self-interest. And yes, people might be better off, but there must be a catch. There must be something wrong because you can't have it without sacrifice. It's not moral. So there has to be something evil going on. So in my view, you know, we can, we can continue to teach the value of free market economics. It's good. But we won the, mark, the, the economics debate a long, long time ago in my view. I mean, the economic profession doesn't know it, but they're just, they're just spinning wheels. Like we've had great economists, Hayek and Mises and Friedman and lots of others, who've articulated the case of free markets as well as anybody can have, have shown that Marx and Keynes and the Neo-Keynesians and all the rest of them are just wrong about economics. That's been done. There's not a lot of more work to do there. You can do another equation and show another stupid economist why he's wrong. Right? But it's not going to lean anywhere because most of the important work has already been done. We've, we've got 
you know, we know the economic history. I mean, anybody with eyes can see the economic history. And the, 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 the sheer fact of the success of capitalism versus the failure of any other system. And one of my favorite stories there is, um, I don't know if any of you have been to Hong Kong. Sadly, I used to say to audiences, you've got to go to Hong Kong at least once in your life uh, because it's such an amazing city, but sadly the Chinese have taken it over, so I don't recommend going to Hong Kong anymore. But Hong Kong, like... At the end of World War II, was a fishing village. There was nothing there. And it's a rock in the middle of nowhere. It's, there's no natural resources. There's no gold. There's no oil. There's nothing. And yet, before the Chinese took over Hong Kong, Hong Kong GDP per capita was higher than New York City. Uh, sorry, higher than the United States. Hong Kong had more skyscrapers than New York City. And it had 7.5 million people living on this rock. Where did they come from? They swam. They emigrated from every other country in Asia just to get there. Why? Because they were offered them free health care or welfare or any other socialist benefit. Why, why did they go to Hong Kong? Because there was some free markets. They could actually, they could actually go out there and, and, and exert themselves and be entrepreneurs and be successful. And they could. It was all theirs. Taxes were very low. Regulations were very minimal. The welfare state was as minimal as you would get anywhere. And this place took off. It created massive amounts of wealth in a very short period of time. What it took America to do in 250 years, they did in 75. So the evidence of the success of capitalism and markets is all around us. All people have to do is open their eyes. They don't care. They don't care about the economics. They don't care about the evidence. What people really care about is morality. What people really want to be is good. And they won't believe that capitalism is good because capitalism is self-interest. And this is why I think the debate, this is why I think we lose the debate. I know a lot of free market guys, libertarians, economists, who try to somehow make the argument that, you know, free markets are altruistic. Well, it, it doesn't, you know, because everybody benefits, which is true. But they don't get what altruism really is after. They don't understand the philosophical power of morality. And as a consequence, I think we continue to fail and fail and fail and fail. And the world is moving away from capitalism. I mean, the fact is that the only philosopher who has challenged the philosophy of altruism and presented an alternative to it because you could argue Nietzsche challenges altruism, but doesn't really provide you with a, uh, a moral code that's an alternative, is Ayn Rand. And this is, I think, why she is such an important figure, and why she is so crucial. In I don't think it's possible to win the battle without her, because she's the only one to actually provide an alternative to the conventional, both religious and secular, moral code that exists out there. I mean, Ayn Rand asks the altruist one Simple, one-word question. Why? Why should I sacrifice to you? Why is your life more important to me than my life? Why is your happiness more important to me than my happiness? Why? What's the purpose of my sacrificing to you? Where does it gain me? If there's no afterlife, what credit do I get? For Rand, the fundamental question is, the fundamental purpose of morality is not to teach you how to sacrifice and die. The fundamental question of morality is how to teach you how to live and be successful at living. <coughs> We're the only species on planet Earth who doesn't have the how to live encoded in our DNA. We have to figure it out. We have to use our mind to figure out how to live. We have to figure out what's good for human beings and what's bad for human beings. It's not encoded. A means of survival. Right? A plant needs sunlight and it needs water. It doesn't have to think. It doesn't have to conceptualize that. It knows it. It's in the DNA. So it reaches to the sun and it goes. its roots are going looking for water. Every species out there knows what to do. And when the environment around it changes, what happens? 
it usually dies because it can't change fast enough. Evolution is too slow. Human beings don't function that way. We don't have the programming. We don't know how to survive. I mean, at the very basic level, we don't know how to survive. Like, how many of you, if I, if I, uh, if I dropped you into the Amazon jungle, you can't rely on your instincts to survive. You would die in hours if you relied on your instincts to survive. What would it require you to do to survive the Amazon jungle? What would you have to do? Think. Think. Figure it out. Stop for a minute and say, okay, I need to figure out shelter. I need to figure out water. I need to figure out water might not be that hard, but I need to figure out what's going to kill me and what's going to not kill me. What's what I can eat, what I can't eat. How to protect myself from nature's animals. How to maybe create some traps to catch the animals. None of that will come to you instinctively. None of that is in your genetic code. Human beings to survive have to figure it out even at the very basic material level. Never mind the most abstract, spiritual, conceptual, philosophical level. We need principles in order to survive. And the purpose of morality is to teach us those principles. The principles for self-survival and ultimately to flourish. What does it take for a human being to thrive, to live the best life that they can live, to flourish as a human being? I mean, this is a, a project that Ayn Rand picks up, if you will, from Aristotle. Like Aristotle's philosophy, Aristotle's ethics is all about identifying the virtues that lead man to be the best that he can be. To live a, a, a life of eudaimonia in, in Greek, you know, of, 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 of flourishing, of happiness, however you want to define it. But fully, a full life. So Rand is saying, yeah, that's exactly what morality is. So let's go out there and figure it out. And the first thing she identifies is, for human beings, in order to live well, the one thing they have to do, the one thing that there's no choice about, is to use their reason. It's to think. It's to use their mind. It's to figure out how the world works and adapt the world to them. We don't adapt to the world. This is the great fallacy in environmentalism on a different topic, right? The great fallacy in environmentalism is the way human beings survive is by changing nature. We chop down trees to build huts. We blow up mountains to build, to build uh, skyscrapers. We build air conditioning so we can live in the desert. We change the environment to fit our needs. That's what we are as a being, as an animal. That's how we survive. So, morality should be a code of values to teach you how to live, how to live well, how to succeed, how to be happy, how to serve your own interests, how to be a good egoist, if you will, how to be appropriately selfish. And, you know, it's very easy to show that the um, kind of the caricature of the person who's selfish, lying, cheating, stealing, just a bad person, right? When we think about selfish, when we think about egoism, when we think about self-interest, we think about lying, cheating, stealing, right? We think about bad people who do bad things. And it's interesting that we think that's selfish, but also making money is selfish by trade. And notice that if those two go in the same category, we may stop mixing them up. And now we think every businessman is the lying, cheating, stealing thief. What do you do if you think every businessman is potentially a lying, cheating, stealing thief? What do you have to do to them? What are you going to do to the businessman if they potentially might be a lying, cheating, stealing thief? Hate them, take away What's that? Well, you're going to hate them, but what would you do? Actually, actually do. Take away their stuff. Or well, you're not going to take away their stuff. Control them. Yeah, you want to control them. You want to regulate them. You want to look over their shoulder. I, I like to use the example of, I don't know if it's true in Germany. My guess is it is. But in America, you walk into an elevator, right? And on the wall in the elevator is a little, a little piece of paper. And it says, 
a government inspector has inspected this elevator, it won't fall and kill you. <laughs> and I always go, whew, I'm so glad. Because <laughs> if not for the government inspector, I know that that greedy, horrible, evil businessman would build elevators that dropped and killed me because I know that the best way to make money in a free market is to kill your customers. <laughs> <laughs> But note that that is the assumption behind almost all regulations. Almost all regulations are based on the idea that without them, those greedy, evil, selfish, self-interested businessmen would do something bad to you. And they don't care, of course, because they're greedy, selfish, they only care about themselves. So McDonald's would poison you. The restaurants would poison you. You'd eat bad meat. And this idea of reputation or this idea that, you know, Somebody who runs a restaurant is a pretty decent human being and is not particularly interested in hurting you and he's trying to make a living and all of that. I mean, that's beyond them. And all regulations, almost every single piece of regulation we have out there is built, is explained in terms of if we didn't have the regulation, some greedy businessman would do something bad and therefore we need the government to protect us. Who? Good for the elevator inspectors. I'm so happy. <laughs> But that's exactly this notion of self-interest as evil. Self-interest is necessarily about lying, stealing, cheating. And, but lying, stealing, cheating is not selfish. It's not in my self-interest to lie, for example. I don't know how many of you have lied before, and I'm not going to ask because I don't really want to know. But lying sucks. I think that's a technical word for it. Lying is not a good strategy to get ahead in life, in anything. And if you don't believe me, try spending a couple of days lying to your girlfriend, or to your boyfriend, or to your spouse. Not good strategy. You're not gonna get very far with it. And the worst person to lie to is whom? Yourself. It's yourself. Because if you rely on reason, if you rely on, real, on, on, on thinking, thinking depends on facts. Thinking depends on reality. And if you're lying about reality and fact, your thinking is going to be corrupted, and therefore your survival is going to be threatened. I mean, I'm getting to the age where I can barely remember what I did last week. If I lie about what I did last week, I have to remember two things instead of just one. What I really did and what I lied, what the lie. But it's not even two things. I have to remember the truth and who I told the truth to. I have to remember the lie and who I told the lie to, why I told them the truth and them the lie. It's so complicated. I can't hold all that information. And think about the mental energy that goes into categorizing that and keeping that afloat, which could be spent on better things, more productive things. So no, lying is not a good strategy. If you know people who lie a lot, they're almost always miserable, pathetic human beings. I mean, the best example of this, which, what is the only profession on earth where lying actually advances you in, 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 in the profession? In every profession, lying is a detriment. People don't want to deal with you except one. Acting. What's that? Acting. No, acting is not lying. Acting is performed. <laughs> There's another profession where lying is kind of a requirement. It's done every day, and you actually get rewarded for doing it well. Politicians. Politicians. Politics is all about lying. Now, I've met a lot of politicians in my life. I've never met a happy one. They're all pathetic, miserable human beings. <laughs> Just look at Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton. Just look in their eyes and you can see it. Miserable. Thieves. Can't live with themselves. Lying, cheating, stealing is a terrible strategy for living. It's disastrous. It's not self-interested. It's self-destructive. It's actually self-destructive. It actually is destroying your own soul who you really are. So, Rand, I think, is the only one to defend capitalism morally because Rand is the only one who's willing to stand up and defend self-interest. And say self-interest properly understood, properly defined, properly articulated, thought through, a philosophy of self-interest is the only morality that can then justify Capitalism, which is a system of self-interest. Indeed, she said she was pro-capitalism because she was pro-egoism. 
rational egoism. And she was pro-rational egoism because ultimately she was pro-reason. And they were all flowed from one another. But think about it this way. If we had a culture of people trying to pursue their rational self-interest, of people who were committed to making their life the best that it could be, people who were convinced that they had the capacity, the reason, the ability to think for themselves, to live for themselves, to pursue their own happiness, what kind of world would people like that want to live in? Would they want mother government sitting on their shoulder telling them what they can and cannot do, what they can and cannot eat, where they can and cannot go? No. People like that, people with self-esteem, people who love their life and want to make the most of their life and are convinced of their ability to do that and who not feel guilty about the fact that they're pursuing their own happiness in their own life, they just want to be left free. They just wouldn't be left alone to go out and do the things that they know they need to do in order to achieve their own happiness, their own success, their own flourishing. They would demand freedom. They would demand capitalism. And with no guilt, with no shame, with no, you know, you see our politicians, the ones who are sometimes pro uh, a, a good policy, and they're apologetic because they can't be proud of their free market position because they know it goes against fundamentally the morality. So if we want a free market revolution, what we really need, and this is what makes the battle so much harder than most of you think, what we really need is a moral revolution. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, now we're going to uh, go into the question round. Sure. Questions. Want. Yeah. We can also start the debate. You're yeah. all uh, allowed to controversially articulate your opinions about uh, the contribution. Um, so, I mean, Germany doesn't have a really free market, like, especially compared to the US. So, I would like to know what do you think about the German approach, like having this social um, market, so to speak? Well, I, I think it's a myth that the United States has a free market. It doesn't fit. Well, but Germany's worse, I agree. I think it's terrible. I, I, I think it's terrible. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's destructive. It's destructive both economically. You could be so much better off. You could be so much wealthier. You could be so much more productive. Um, and it's, and it's uh, you know, destructive to the human soul. Uh, you know, how many entrepreneurs are discouraged from pursuing their dreams? How many people who want to start businesses and are allowed to start the businesses, want to pursue a particular path in life, are not allowed to pursue that path in life? I think in many respects, um, you know, everybody suffers. Maybe the poor suffer the most because, um, you know, the free of the market is the fewer poor people there are, if at all, if there are any poor people, because uh, they become more and more productive as you have more and more entrepreneurship and you have, as you have a, a greater and greater free market. So, no, it, it, the world is in a disastrous place because it ignores the benefits of free markets. And Germany, uh, which has a, a, an incredibly productive workforce, hardworking workforce, very intelligent, and you're, you're barely uh, achieving what your potential has. Yeah. Um, so, you would argue that being wealthy or being materialistically good off is really the ultimate goal? Is it, does it's it not the ultimate goal. I mean, does it provide the highest utility uh, for human beings? I don't know what utility means for human beings. Uh, I, I think all that whole terminology is is bogus. I'm not a utilitarian, and I think it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a bad way of looking at things. No, it, for some people, money is very important. For other people, it's not. Uh, it's why some people become teachers like me. I could have been a financier on Wall Street. Could have made a lot more money. We, ch we make choices about how we want. But the beauty of free markets is you get to make the choice and you have a maximum of opportunities available to you and you get to choose your own values. Now, I think material wealth is really, really, really important for everybody, some level of. It's why we care so much about poverty. Clearly, we care about poverty. Why? Because we know that being poor is bad. That is not having enough material wealth is not good. You do not want to live in Venezuela right now. To a large extent because they're very, very, very poor. And they also happen to be very, very unfree. 
But both of those go together. So um, the, the spiritual values of freedom uh, are consistent with the material values of wealth. And both are important. And one leads to the other. They're not independent of one another. You have to be free to be rich. And if you're rich and unfree, you won't stay rich very long. So, uh, but yes, I, you know, uh, again, material wealth is important. It's not trivial. It's, it's not the only thing, and it might not be the most important thing. Um, but it's what accompanies the most important thing, which is morality. If, you know, the most important thing is to be a good person. But to be a good person, a society that's built to, to facilitate good people is a society that leaves people free. And that therefore, we're going to be rich. It's cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that mainstream philosophy basically is very uncomfortable with self-interest and the, the concept of selfishness. In a way. Um, I wonder why that is. What is the, what's the underlying reason? I mean, you stated it. But what is what is the reason uh, for that? I have my own like you know theories on that, but I want to hear yours. I mean, partially, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it certainly is. You know, philosophy is ultimately shaped by the geniuses who are the great philosophers, and it just hasn't been um, since Aristotle. Anybody who's picked up on this thread of self-interest and really made it something other than Ayn Rand. Uh, but oh, but I think the dominant theme, the dominant reason why it has, it's unquestioned, is Christianity. Christianity is is a religion of altruism. Buddhism as well. What's that? Buddhism. Yes, but it, but I'm talking about the West. In the West, what dominates is Christianity. Buddhism is a different version. Buddhism is a rejection of the material world. Christianity is, is an embracing of suffering. We all, the Christians, walk around around the neck, and I'm sorry if I'm offending somebody here, around the neck with a cross. What does the cross represent? Absolute suffering. The worst kind of possible death possible. And somebody else, Jesus in this case, suffering for your sins. Talk about an injustice. right? So not suffering for their own sins, that I can accept but suffering for your sins. So Christianity is through and th is, is, is a, um, has basically uh, made altruism the dominant moral code uh, in the West. It is a religion of suffering. It is a religion that, that elevates suffering to, to a virtuous position. Um, it's not an accident that the saints are Christian saints. Uh, in that sense, I think it deviates even from Judaism, but but it is it is the dominant force in the West. Christianity has shaped so much of Western thinking and Western culture over the last two thousand years. So even non-religious Westerners, when it comes to their ethics, are completely Christian because they can't think out of the Christian box. So maybe they've given up the metaphysics, they've abandoned God, but they haven't given up the morality which is the morality of Christianity. We're all living under Christian code when it comes to morality today. What is the best criticism of objectivism and this fair capitalism that you have heard so far? I don't know because, uh, you know, I think capitalism works. It's, it's the right system. I, I don't know what the criticism could be. I don't have any. It's the right system. It's It's... It, you know, it, it doesn't mean that everybody that functions within capitalism is going to be perfect. But the systems, yeah, it's it's not it, it's not easy to implement. It's not easy to understand how it should be implemented. But I, I see no flaws. Legalization of drugs, for example. It, 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 relative to having them illegal, what's better? I mean, if you if so, it's not a good. The fact that heroin, the, the fact that people use heroin is not a good thing, but to ban heroin from use is much worse than to make it legal. I mean, if you think about Coca-Cola producing heroin and putting, say, marketing into that, could you imagine it could have eroding effects on society that wouldn't be worth the free market system? No. In no case? No, because again, look, you're not going to get a society that's free 
without people taking the personal responsibility mm -hmm. of what that freedom implies. Yeah. And part of what personal responsibility of freedom means is that, you know, so for example, when I, when I moved to the U.S., I don't know if you've ever been to the U.S., but in the United States, they have hundreds of different, they used to have, they've, they've changed, this is probably 30 years ago. They used to have hundreds of different beer commercials. All the beer commercials were the same. Basically, young women in bikinis running around drinking beer. <laughs> and all the beer tasted exactly the same. Mm. Now, I'm not a beer duker. I know that's a sin in Germany, but I'm not a big beer duker. But to me, all the beer tasted the same. And all the commercials had the... Now, in a, I always thought, in a rational world where people actually use their minds even a little bit, mm. would anybody run these commercials? And the answer is no. They wouldn't have any effect. I mean, they didn't have an effect on me. I just looked at him and said, okay, a bunch of, yeah, I watched them for the bikinis, not for the beer, right? But it's, it, it doesn't, advertising doesn't work that way. It's, um, advertising is there to, to provide us with information. We need to analyze that information and we need to be responsible for our own actions. And if Coca Cola got behind heroin, as if that would happen. I mean, that's another big step that you have to take, right? That a marketing agency would be willing and interested in representing the heroin cartels. Mm -hmm. Maybe they would. Maybe they would. I doubt it, but maybe. But but and, and, and then we would all say, ah, huh, because uh, this marketing campaign says heroin is good. I should take heroin. <laughs> I can't Google heroin and find out how disastrous and horrific it is. I mean, I will say this, that in, in, in if you legalize drugs, one of the things that would happen is that... Um, there would be an entire industry that would arise that would counter the effects of a drug addiction. I think more people would try drugs, okay? And then they would take whatever medicine or whatever gimmick the, the industry could, came up with to get rid of the addiction. And then, so what? Is there something inherently evil about trying drugs? I don't no, think no, so. No, I don't think it's, so. It's a damage it does to you. But you see, if, 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 if capitalism only can come about when people take responsibility for their own lives and take responsibility for their own thinking, then those kind of people are not going to just in mass uh, devote themselves to self-destruction. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much people really hate capitalism and how much of it is like a you know play of words or quirky, quirky use of language. Uh, for example, there was a study um, where they asked American students um, like whether they like socialism or capitalism, and those who like socialism were also asked what they think socialism even was. And they then came up with some sort of capitalism light, you know, yeah. capitalism which is just fairer for some reason. I mean, people really hate losing what they have. So if you are like an urban leftist who is somewhat wealthy and who like to enjoy a matcha latte in your very good privately owned coffee shop, you do not want to annihilate the coffee shop. You want to have cheaper martial latte, or you want to have basic income so that you can always pay for martial latte. Uh, so I think it's harder to argue against that. It's very easy to argue against labor camps or against uh, mass poverty. But how would you argue against capitalism light? Well, so, so let me, uh, two questions. Let me first address this issue of words, that it's, that it's there. I, I don't think that's true. And, and yes, I agree with you, they don't understand what the words mean. That's absolutely true. But if you explain it to them, if you tell them what capitalism is, so for example, they did a survey in the US, people hate, ca only like 20% like capitalism, 40% like free markets, 60% like free enterprise. So everybody said, well, let's start using free enterprise instead of capitalism and we win. But then when you ask people what they mean by free enterprise, it's capitalism light, it's socialism light, it's, it's, you know, it's not capitalism. That's why they hate capitalism, right? Because it means much more to them in terms of the content. Um, I agree with you. It's it's very hard, and this is why I think, for example, Ayn Rand resonates more in Eastern Europe and in Latin America than she does in Germany, right? Because the Germany life is comfortable. It's mediocre, right? It's not exceptional, but it's mediocre, and mediocre is not bad. Particularly when you think of most of the alternatives in human history have been really, really bad. We've barely survived. We've been dirt poor. We've been subsistence farmers. The kind of wealthy mediocrity that we live under today is not bad at all. I get a new iPhone every single year. How cool is that, right? So people can ignore where that comes from. Even the mediocrity depends on something. It depends on production. It depends on some economic freedom. And therefore, it's very, very difficult to convince them to take a risk in their mind 
of more freedom because then they can get even more than what they have today. They're pretty satisfied with what they have today. This is, I, it's a huge challenge. And this again goes back to morality, in my view. Because a good morality tells you to be ambitious. It tells you to strive in life. It tells you not just to want a macchiato, but to want everything the freedom can provide you, psychologically, uh, spiritually, and materially. It tells you to try to be the best not just mediocre, but the best human being you can be. Um, and, and, and this is the challenge we have. This is, again, why it's so hard. It's, it's so hard because it's not about economics. The economics are easy. I can show you on a chart. I can prove equations. We can do the, the economic analysis to show the free markets work in terms of creating more wealth. People don't care. And, and they're not ambitious enough to care. So part of it is moral ambition. Part of it is wanting to have a great life. And, 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 you know, it would be nice if, if we had um, more variation between countries or more free countries and, and allow more immigration so that the ambitious people could actually move to the places. Because I could have, you know, I, I moved to America for these reasons, right? I was ambitious. And I could have stayed in Israel. I would have had a fine life and comfortable and everything. But I wanted, I wanted more. And that's why I moved to the U.S. And that's the kind of spirit we need to inculcate in people and that's why it's not just a it's a psychological almost struggle that we're facing and and you know eastern europe and south america they're still not quite as rich they're not quite as comfortable and that's why they're willing to consider more radical ideas right, because of that yeah i think my question actually ties into what you just said and if i basically summarize the main theme of your talk it's that everything hinges on rationality and what I found over the years, what I find extremely peculiar with the human condition is that me personally, but a lot of people that I know, can know perfectly well what I should do now and what the consequences are if I don't do it. And I fully understand it rationally, yep. but yet I don't do it. Yep. So what's your interpretation of that? Well, I mean, again, people are not taught, not encouraged to be rational. Not in a, not in a, not in a proper sense, and they're not told why they should be rational. That is that it's good for them because they're not supposed to say that, right? You're not supposed to say that you're supposed to live for yourself and therefore do things that are good for you. So it's 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 very much about education. It's about educating individuals to be self-interested, to care about themselves and see rationality as a means to achieving that end. Indeed, as the only means to achieving that end. And, and you know, and that, that ignoring the rational, ignoring the, the right path, is self-destructive. And the self-destruction matters. Again, it goes back to m being ambitious, people wanting to live a good life. And how do you inculcate that? I don't know, but you have to start young. <laughs> but do you, do you agree that, I mean, I've studied objectives for 10 years, I fully understand all this, and I mean, I find myself doing things that are purely rational, and I know that I'm irrational. Or person. irrational. Yeah. Irrational, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but so it takes work. Right? It takes effort. But is there also struggle. like a biology, biological component? I mean, our soul is really a rational animal, but we're still an animal. Like, we have a limbic system, we have a driven to parts by... We definitely have, uh, you know, so, so the, the default for human beings, uh, Ayn Rand talks about this, the default for human beings is a perceptual level. Conception, i.e. being rational, being abstract, takes effort. 